Here's television news. The network links between the East and the Midwest will be ready sooner than expected. The links between Midwest stations will be ready by October, and the cable to the Midwest by December. We hope to televise Christmas from St. Louis to Boston. Witness a tour behind the scenes in television. This evening, television's magic eye brings you the story of television. A trip backstage to meet the men who made this miracle of the 20th century possible. Good evening, friends. My name's Ben Grauer. And I'm very happy to welcome you again into a behind-the-scenes tour in eyewitness television. Tonight I'd like to tell you just how the television system which you're viewing today came into being. And I'd like you to meet some of the men who held a dream and stayed with that dream to bring it to the reality which you now know seated before you in your li living room. In order to do that, I think it'd be a good idea if we reviewed, if I could refresh your mind on some of the facts about television pictures and how they're broadcast, how they are received in your home so that you'll understand the application of the inventions which we are going to talk about this evening. Here then is the, the inside story of television. You see, television consists in taking pictures and sending them out over the air. The camera is used just as in any other kind of picture taking, but there's no film in this camera. Developing and processing film takes too long. Besides, you can't broadcast pictures. You can, however, broadcast electrical impulses which will make a picture. Behind the lens of this camera, which seems to be approaching us, behind the lens of this camera is the special tube that takes the television picture. It's called the iconoscope. And we'll see it in just a moment. There it is, the iconoscope. Inside this tube is a plate which is completely covered with one half million photoelectric cells which act somewhat as electrical eyes. Whenever light strikes these minute little cells, they become full of electricity. Charged with electricity is the word that's used. Now the amount of light falling on them determines the amount of electrical charge in each cell. A picture is made up of many points of light and of shadow. Some sections of the picture are light and some dark. Here, for example, as we watch the two men fencing, the fencer's jacket is lighter than his trousers, as you can see. And therefore, the light from the jacket develops stronger charges on the plate. All the details of the scene are reproduced in that same way. The electric eye sees the various differences in the light level and develops electrical charges to match those levels. All combined, these electrical charges then make up the electrical picture of a scene. Now in broadcasting television, a complete picture does not go out on the air at once. Pictures are sent out bit by bit. Each electric eye creates an electric impulse of its own. And these are sent, as you see there, in single file, one after the other. As they reach the receiver, they strike the screen in order and are turned back into points of light and shadow. Each dot of the picture is broadcast in order, one at a time, sort of like a telegraph message. But it's done so rapidly that they keep up with any action of the people in the scene. We've slowed it down here so you can see how it's done. You see how the picture is being filled up from top to bottom and from left to right as the little images go out from the transmitter into the receiver. Now we'll speed it up as it's actually done in television. 30 complete pictures going out every second. And in reconstructing the picture at the receiver, four million impulses strike the screen one after the other every second to give you that moving television picture which you're viewing now. Well, that's television. Four million dots of light per second bringing the world into your home. And now we're going back a few years into history to understand the development, the very beginning of television. We're not going to cover many names associated with the first discoveries in electricity or learn how it was harnessed for man's utility. We won't cover the inventors of radio and the miracle of the vacuum tube, but we will concentrate on the people who developed the electronic picture, the miracle of television. 
So this then is the story that led to the development of two television tubes. And here they are. First, the iconoscope that takes the picture here in the studio and sends it out. And next, the kinescope that reproduces the picture in your own receiver. And like the story of many great scientific achievements, the story of the pictures of television centers around an accident, an accidental discovery. Let's turn back to the year 1873. The ingredients for this discovery were a curious young telegraph operator named Mr. May and a stray beam of sunlight. It seems that May was the operator of the eastern terminus of the Atlantic Cable in Valencia, Ireland it was, when one day, due to sunlight, his equipment started behaving most strangely. Hey, Bill. Yeah? What do you make of this? Listen to that sound. Well, I think the meter is broken. The volume isn't very constant. Well, that's just it. What's causing it? I don't know. Let's put this meter on the line and check it, eh? Whoa, what happened? Well, the current is normal now. Look at this meter. Hey, look at that. Well, for no reason at all, it jumps up like it was struck by lightning. Set volume control constant. Uh, I think this open resistor here seems to be the clue in this mystery. I've checked everything, but it seems to be that... Hey, look at this. So you got the answer? Yes, but I don't understand it. Now, the current jumps every time the sunlight coming through the window falls on this resistor. Now, watch this. how high the current goes when the resistor is hit by the sunlight? Yes. Now watch what happens when I pull the shade down and shield it from the sun. I don't get it. A little sunlight falls on an ordinary selenium resistor and that steps up the current some 50%. That gives us only one possible answer. Sunlight falling on the selenium lessens its resistance. This material is photosensitive and when light hits it, more electricity is passed. And that was the beginning of television. May had discovered that light could change the current passing through the element selenium. Selenium was sensitive to light. It was photosensitive. Two years later, an American named G.R. Carey dreamed of perfecting television and decided to use this photosensitive principle of May's to transmit pictures over a wire. He was working on the first television system known to man. And yet the people of his day called his experiments another wild dream. That's it. Martha, Martha, come here. Good gracious, George, what is it? Martha, look at this. I'm going to try out my new system. I'm trying to send a picture from one place to another using electric wires to carry the image. But George, that's wonderful, but how? Look at this. When these selenium cells, when struck by light, give off an electric current because they are photosensitive, for each cell here, there is a wire leading to a corresponding electric ball over here. Now, we let the image of the black letter A fall on the selenium cells. And the letter A appears on the bank of light. Of course. The black A reflects less light upon the cells. Therefore, less current is carried over to these bulbs, and they, as a result, don't light up as much. And the A is reproduced here. George, that's marvelous. Why, you might even be able to send a picture of a person that way. Imagine it, sending a picture over wires. Why, you could even send one around the world. Oh, it sounds fantastic. Hmm. Too fantastic, I'm afraid. Mm. Why, to send a complete picture would require hundreds of thousands of cells, wires, and bulbs. The idea is there, but the system is too complicated to be practical. Yes, Carey's system could not be made to work because the photocurrents were too weak to operate his bank of lights. But it was a beginning. It was the first complete television idea that man recorded. Mm -hmm. 
Nine years later, a German scientist named Paul Nipkow came up with the answer to Carey's problem. Nipkow decided to break the picture up into many parts and send those parts one by one over a single telephone wire to a distant point. To accomplish this, he invented a machine called the scanning disk. Oh, this is very exciting. Does this televisor work like a regular camera? No, it is quite different. A, a camera takes your picture all at once. Oh. But with my scanning disk, I, I photograph your face bit by bit with a beam of light so that we can carry your, 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 the pieces of your image over a telephone wire and then rebuild it at the other end, bit by bit. Oh, how does it work? It's all done with electricity. The light is sent from this machine through a series of holes here in this disc. Uh, here's another disc, just like it, rotating. When we rotate the disc and the first hole comes up, a beam of light passes through the top of your face, and then the, the, uh, the next hole is, is uh, lower than the first, so that the second beam crosses a little lower on your face. And this goes on until your complete face has been scanned from top to bottom uh, with, with horizontal beams of light. Oh, and, and that takes my picture? Precisely. Ooh. The uh, reflected light is picked up by these photosensitive uh, resistors, which send out a varying current uh, to an electric light in the receiver. Uh, I'll, I'll turn it off. Oh, well, what's the picture seen on? That is my problem. I do not know. You don't know? No. Another scanning disk, just like this one, could uh, rebuild your image with a beam of light. It, uh, as this light of varying intensity is focused through a revolving disk, uh, your, your image uh, um, could be cast upon a screen. Hmm. Sounds complicated. It is. Will it work? Yes. Not now, however. We will have to wait for a few years. Years? You mean you, you, you can't televise me now? <laughs> no. Do you think a modest student of philosophy could, could uh, perfect such a far-flung idea as seeing pictures at a distance, single-handed? No. We will have to wait. Other men will have dreams. And they will combine them with mine. Yes, Paul Nipko had to wait for years before his dream of seeing at a distance was realized. However, he had devised a mechanical television system. And although his clumsy mechanical equipment could not send a picture, Nipko did contribute the basic scanning principle. This scanning was to be perfected in later years inside a vacuum tube. Let's see how this was done. An English scientist named William Crookes was one of the distinguished men who studied the striking effects taking place inside of vacuum tubes when electric currents pass through gases. Crookes was experimenting with the application of electricity to a glass tube that had been pumped free of air. When in the course of his experiments, the light which filled his tube contracted to a well-defined beam, Crookes sensed that he was working with electrically charged particles, unencumbered by inactive matter. He was right. Not until years later were those unknown elements discovered really to be minute particles of negative electricity with a mass, a weight, far lighter than that of an atom. And they were given the name electrons. Up until 1895, however, the electron was an uncontrollable child of science and electricity. It was then that a German professor named Ferdinand Braun harnessed the electron in the cathode ray tube and started putting it to work. But Ferdinand, how does it work? In this tube, the heated tungsten filament gives off electrons. Mm -hmm. Since this end of the tube is closed, the electrons travel in this direction. And here is what I found. By placing magnets on either side of this tube, I can deflect the electron beam either this way or that. Uh -huh. Now what produces the glow at the end of the tube? 
When a beam of electrons strikes a fluorescent screen, it gives light. So, if we put a screen here and shoot the electrons through here and deflect them from one side to the other, we can trace a continuous line of light on the screen. And thus, Brown paved the way to a modern electronic television receiver. Despite this great advance in electronics, however, it was not until 1907 that a Russian scientist named Boris Rosing furnished the key to tracing a picture on one end of an electron tube. It was he who said, And so, gentlemen, rather than tracing just a line of light across the end of the tube, we will vary the electron beam intensity and trace the light of shadow of a complete picture across the end of the tube. It was this theory of Rosings that was later developed into the present-day television picture tube in your receiver. The first complete television system to transmit and receive a picture was the mechanical apparatus of Charles Francis Jenkins. In 1925, Jenkins explained his system. The image to be televised is lighted by this lamp. The light passes through this hole and is reflected by this prismatic rotating disc which breaks down the image into lines of light. These beams of light are reflected onto these photoelectric cells. They fall on them and are turned into electricity. In the receiver, the amplifier multiplies these minute electrical signals. Early television inventors were unable to make their systems work because they didn't have these vacuum tubes to amplify the weak signals. This neon light receives the amplified beams of light and shines them onto another rotating prismatic disk, which reflects them onto this glass lens. There is the image reproduced in the viewing screen. And now we of NBC television and at Eyewitness are honored to have in our studios the distinguished scientist who helped perfect the crude picture receiver the kinescope of Boris Rosing, and who alone was responsible for the development of the picture transmitter, the camera tube, the iconoscope. We are happy to introduce Dr. Vladimir Zwarikin, Director of Economic Research, I should say Electronic Research, of the Radio Corporation of America. Glad to have you. Good evening. <coughs> it uh, has been very interesting seeing men working on television before me. I know that these names, these great names in electronic research and television research are familiar to you, but I'd like to ask you, Dr. Swarikin, what originally led you to be so interested in television? Then, it is like fever. Like when the television bug bites you, you never can stop working on it. I see, and you devoted your energies in your, since your student days to that. So, when I was young, I happened to see work doing on television at that time. Well, I think the bug bit me. The bug <laughs> bit you there. Oh, who, you say you saw work. Uh, any, uh, who did you see working that first stimulated you in it? Oh, Dr. Uh, Boris Rosing. Oh, yes. He was my professor of physics uh, in the university in St. Petersburg. Uh -huh. And I coaxed him to let me help him evenings at his work with television. Well, the world is glad that he would let you work with him. Uh, we were talking about the iconoscope, which is your uh, unique development. I wonder if among these tubes, which we have here, is one of the early examples of your iconoscope. Certainly. Is this one? Here is a tube which was made in 1923. 25 uh, years ago. 
That's right. Mm -hmm. That's Grand Theater of Iconoscope. Ah, I see. That's the first real electronic picture, too. That's right. It has the same, similar uh, mosaic and the electron gun. The electron gun. Of course, the picture produced by this tube was very crude, and it required enormous amount of light to produce it. But basic idea involved is practically the same as in modern tubes. You kept working, of course, Doctor, there in the laboratories, right? Oh, yes. What was your next uh, step? Well, we continued to work and develop on the same idea, and this is the tube made in 1931. Uh-huh. Same it's gun and plate there? Exactly the same. What kind of a picture did this one uh, produce? Was it good? Well, the best to see it, we have picture taken on 16 millimeter film here. Oh, you have some film that was taken in those days? That's right. Of the picture this produced? What, we, can we see that? Oh, there it is now, Doctor. Oh, yes. Well, I can tell that it's a young lady smoking a cigarette. The picture's kind of crude. Yeah. Uh, but how many, uh, how did you classify this picture? That is 16 lines picture. 60 lines. That 60 means from lines. the top to the bottom, it's built up That's in right. 60 lines of scanning. Well, that picture wasn't too good. You kept on with your work, Doctor? Yes, we continue our work, and particularly trying to improve the resolution of the tube mm. and the sensitivity. And here is the iconoscope made in 1935. 35. It was big improvement compared with this one. Have you Paul Nitka. These were worked out in the uh, RCA laboratories. That's correct. Through years of, well, let's see, we started in 1923, you said. 1923? 19, the first two, way yes. back there. And now and we're up to about 37. 37. 37. But at that time we decided we are on the wrong track and decided to change the work well, a little bit. What did you do? And then uh, we continue our development and develop this Orticon, abbreviation for Ort. Iconoscope. Ah, oh, yes. When you say orthicon, it uh, comes into a word that we're familiar with now, the, the tube that's being used now. This, in other words, you started to get on the right track for today's development. Yes. The biggest difference between the iconoscope and the art is that the scanning can produce with low velocity beam, mm -hmm. not with high velocity beam as an iconoscope. Gives you a chance for more amplification? Yes, and uh, also eliminates some of the difficulties we had with the iconoscope. What then we continue to work, and that is improvement of the Orticon in about 1939. That's, that's a big one, isn't but it? But that was too big for practical use. Mm -hmm. So we improved that, and that was the 1940 edition of Orticon. Uh -huh. And this tube is still used now in some of the cameras. I see. It's much sensitive than a iconoscope, and uh, uh, produce very good contrast. You, you say sensitive, that means you didn't have to have the extremely hot and intense light that you used That's to have right. at the beginning tube. You can use about uh, one twentieth of uh, light with this tube than with iconoscope. That's a tremendous cut. And you're still improving at this stage in 1940. Oh yes, we continue to work with this thing and uh, the result was that oh, we yes. developed this image orthicon. Ah yes, the image orthicon. This is the tube which is used now, isn't it? In the field work. Yes, I just wanted to, our friends in television to see this. Uh, it has several parts. This is the... This is the image tube part. The image is pro projected on the photosensitive surface here. Mm -hmm. Then by magnetic field, the electron image which is created by photosensitive surface is projected on the target in this place. Uh -huh. Then from this one, it is orticon. That means the the target is scanned with low velocity beam. Mm -hmm. Then on this hand, we have the electron multiplier. Amplifier. Uh, we call it multiplier, but yes. that works as amplifier. I see. And in other words, the tube consists of three practical independent uh, electronic devices. And with the sensitivity of this tube, you're able to go into a badly lighted place, like out of doors or into a oh, price yes. light arena and so on. Uh, it is uh, several hundred times more sensitive than iconoscope. Are they it, all the... Go ahead, sir. It can uh, project the, uh, transmit the picture in the moonlight. By just the light of moonlight, eh? Exactly. Are they all the same size, Doctor? 
Oh, mm -hmm. no. Here's yeah. one tube. We have what it you... looks like this. And this is the same as that? I mean, exactly. does the same work? It consists of the same parts, the image tube, yes. orticon, and electron multiplier. That's mm -hmm. amazing. And the, the place where the picture comes in is only about the size of a dime. That's correct. Well, this could be used then for a miniature camera, like uh, the, the miniature cameras in regular photography. That's right. And besides, it can be used in many other purposes besides television broadcast. Mm -hmm. For instance, to transmit our vision in accessible places. You mean up in the sky and... On the sky and the bottom of the sea, any place of danger where we don't like to... Well, when here we have the, the, the result of 25 years of work, Doctor. When you started to work on your dream, did you know it would come to this great reality? Well, we, it works as we dreamed about it. I see. But, of course, we didn't know that it will take these shapes at mm -hmm. that time. Well, I think you're to be congratulated for holding on to your dream and bringing it to the re wonderful reality of today, Doctor. Thank you, man. Thank you very much, Dr. Zworykin. And I want to say thank you, Dr. Zworykin, and we hope that you've enjoyed this little visit behind the scenes in Eyewitness. I know I've learned a lot about the technical facts behind tubes, and also I think I've learned something very important. To hold on to your dream as the example we've seen today through the work of Dr. Zworykin and his colleagues, that dream come to a magnificent realization through bits of tungsten and copper and finely fashioned glass, creating the miracle of iconoscope television we know today. Let's all dream, and let's hope your dreams come true. NBC wishes to thank Columbia University and the Radio Corporation of America for the loan of authentic scientific apparatus for this telecast. NBC's Pioneer Television Station, WNBT, New York. Tomorrow, mostly sunny and mild. Ladies, tomorrow will be a day to get...